Travels of Marco Polo, Book 2, Chapter 6, The Return of the Great Khan to the City of Khanbalik, and of the honor he does Christians and Jews. The Great Khan, having won his signal victory, returned with great pomp and triumph to the capital city of Khanbalik. This took place in the month of November, and he continued to reside here during February and March, in which latter was our festival of Easter. Being aware that this was one of our principal solemnity times, he commanded all the Christians to attend him and bring with them their book, which contains the four Gospels of the Evangelists. After causing it to be repeatedly perfumed with the incense and ceremonious manner, he devoutly kissed it and directed that the same should be done by all his nobles who were present. This was his usual practice upon each of the principal Christian festivals, such as Easter and Christmas, and he observed the same at the festivals of the Saracens, Jews, and idolaters. Upon being asked his motive for this conduct, he said, There are four great prophets who are reverenced and worshipped by the different classes of mankind. The Christians regard Jesus Christ as their divinity, the Saracens, Mahomet, the Jews, Moses, and the idolaters, Sakyamuni, Burkhan, Buddha, in the most eminent among their idols. I do honor and show respect to all four, so that I may be sure of invoking whichever among them is true and supreme in heaven. But from the manner in which his majesty acted towards them, it was evident that he regarded the faith of the Christians as the truest and the best, his professors being enjoined to do nothing that was not filled with virtue and holiness. By no means, however, would he permit them to bear the cross before them in their processions, because upon it so exalted a being as Christ had been scourged and put to death. It may perhaps be asked by some why, if he showed such a preference for the faith of Christ, did he not embrace it and become a Christian? He gave Niccolo and Maffeo his reason for not doing so, when, on his spending them as his ambassadors to the Pope, they ventured to talk with him about it. Wherefore, he said, should I become a Christian? You yourselves must perceive that the Christians of these countries are ignorant, incompetent persons who are unable to perform anything miraculous, whereas you see that the idolaters can do whatever they will. When I sit at the table, the cups that were in the middle of the hall come to me filled with wine and other beverages, spontaneously and without being touched by human hand, and I drink from them. They have the power of controlling bad weather and causing it to retreat whence it came, and many other wonderful gifts of that nature. You are witnesses that their idols have the faculty of speech and predict whatever is required. If I become a convert to the faith of Christ and profess myself a Christian, the nobles of my court and other persons who do not incline to that religion will ask me what caused me to receive baptism and embrace Christianity. What extraordinary powers, they will say, what miracles have been displayed by its ministers, whereas the idolaters declare that what they exhibit is performed through their holiness and the influence of their idols. To this I shall not know what answer to make, and I shall be considered to be in grievous error, while the idolaters, who by means of their profound art can effect such wonders, might without difficulty bring about my death. But return to your pope and request him in my name to send hither a hundred persons learned in your law who, being confronted with the idolaters, shall have power to counter them and show that they themselves are endowed with similar art, but refrain from exercising it because it is derived from evil spirits, and thus shall compel them to give up such practices in their presence. When I witness this, I shall ban them and their religion and shall allow myself to be baptized. All my nobles will then also receive baptism, and this will be imitated by my subjects in general. In the end, the Christians of these parts will exceed those in your own country. From this, it must be evident that if the Pope had sent out persons duly qualified to preach the gospel, the great Khan would have embraced Christianity, for it is certain that he had a strong leaning toward it. To return to our subject, we shall now speak of the rewards and honors he bestows on such as distinguish themselves in battle. Chapter 7 of the Rewards Granted to Those Who Distinguish Themselves in Battle the Great Khan appointed twelve of his most intelligent nobles to acquaint themselves with the conduct of the officers and men of his army, particularly on expeditions and in battles, and to present reports to him. On the basis of their respective merits, he advances them in his service, raising those who commanded a hundred men to the command of a thousand, and presenting many with vessels of silver as well as the customary tablets or warrants of authority. The tablets given to those commanding a hundred men are of silver, to those commanding a thousand of gold or of silver gilt, and those who command 10,000 receive tablets of gold bearing the head of a lion, the former weighing 120 saggy, about 20 ounces, and about 3.5 by 12 inches in size, and these with the lion's head, 220. On the tablet is an inscription to this effect. By the power and might of the great God, and of the great grace which he hath accorded to our emperor, be the name of the Khan blessed, and let all such as disobey him be slain and destroyed. The officers who hold these tablets have special privileges, and in the inscription is specified the duties and the powers of their respective commands. He who is at the head of a hundred thousand men, or the commander-in-chief of a grand army, has a golden tablet weighing three hundred saggy, which the inscription mentioned above and at the bottom is engraved the figure of a lion, together with the sun and moon. He exercises also the privileges of his high command, as set forth in the magnificent tablet. Whenever he rides in public, an umbrella is carried over his head, denoting the rank and authority he holds, and when he is seated, 
it is always upon a silver chair. The Great Khan likewise confers upon certain of his nobles tablets on which are represented figures of the Jair Falcon, in virtue of which they have the power to take with them as their guard of honor the whole army of any great prince. They can also use the horses of the Imperial Stud at their pleasure and can appropriate the horses of any officers of lower rank. Chapter 8 of the figure of the Great Khan, his four principal wives, and the annual selection of young women for him. Kublai, who is styled the Great Khan, or Lord of Lords, is of middle stature, that is, neither tall nor short, and there is a just proportion in his whole figure. His complexion is fair and occasionally suffused with red, like the bright tint of the rose, which adds much grace to his countenance. His eyes are black and handsome, his nose well-shaped and prominent. He has four wives of the first rank who are considered legitimate, and upon the decease of the Great Khan, the eldest-born son of any one of these succeeds to the empire. They all bear the title of empress and have their separate corps. None of them has fewer than 300 young female attendants of great beauty, together with a multitude of youths as pages and eunuchs, as well as ladies of the bedchamber, so that the number of persons belonging to each of their courts amounts to 10,000. When His Majesty desires the company of one of his empresses, he either sends for her or goes himself to her chamber. Besides these, he has many concubines provided for his use by a province of Tartary named Kongurat, the inhabitants of which are distinguished for beauty of features and fairness of complexion. Every second year, or oftener, as suits his pleasure, the great Khan sends thither his officers who select one hundred or more of the handsomest of the young women, according to the standards of beauty set forth in their instructions. They make their selection as follows. Upon their arrival, these commissioners give orders for assembling all the young women of the province and appoint qualified persons to examine them. The examiners, upon careful inspection of each of them, that is to say, of the hair, countenance, eyebrows, mouth, lips, and other features, as well as the symmetry of these, estimate their value at 17, 18, 20 or more marks, according to the degree of beauty. If the Great Khan asks for those who were rated at perhaps 20 or 21 marks, these are then selected from the rest and they are conveyed to his court. Upon their arrival in his presence, he causes a new examination to be made by a different set of inspectors, and a further selection takes place after which 30 or 40 are retained for his own chamber. These are committed to the care of certain elderly ladies of the palace, whose duty it is to observe them attentively during the night, to ascertain that they have not any concealed imperfections, that they sleep tranquilly, and do not snore, have sweet breath, and are free from any unpleasant scent. Having undergone this rigorous scrutiny, they are divided into parties of five, each taking turn for three days and three nights in His Majesty's inner apartment, where they are to perform every service that is required of them, and he does with them as he likes. When this term is completed, they are relieved by another party, and so on, until all have taken their turn, whereupon the first five recommence their attendance. While one serves in the inner chamber, another is stationed in the outer apartment. If His Majesty should have need for anything, such as drink or food, the former relays his commands to the latter, who immediately gets whatever is needed. In this way, the duty of waiting upon His Majesty's person is performed exclusively by these young females. The remainder, who have received a lower rating, are assigned to the different lords of the household, under whom they are instructed in cookery, in dressmaking, and other suitable work. And when any person belonging to the court expresses an inclination to take a wife, the Great Khan bestows upon him one of these damsels along with a handsome dowry. In this manner, he provides for all of them among his nobility. It may be asked whether the people of the province do not feel themselves aggrieved in having their daughters thus forcefully taken from them by the sovereign. They certainly do not. On the contrary, they regard it as a favor and an honor, and those who are the fathers of handsome children feel highly gratified if he designs to choose their daughters. If, they say, my daughter is born under an auspicious planet and to good fortune, his majesty can best fulfill her destinies by matching her nobly, which it would not be in my power to do. If, on the other hand, the daughter misbehaves or a mishap befalls her and she is disqualified, the father attributes the disappointment to the evil influence of her stars. Chapter 9 of the Great Khan's Sons by His Four Wives The Great Khan has had 22 sons by his four wives, the eldest of whom, named Chinggis, actually Chinkim, was supposed to succeed his father as emperor, and this was confirmed to him during the lifetime of his father. But he died, leaving a son whose name is Temur, who is to succeed the dominion. The disposition of this prince is good, and he is endowed with wisdom and valor. Of the latter, he has given proofs in several successful battles. Besides these, his majesty has twenty-five sons by his concubines, all of them brave soldiers having been continually active in military affairs. These he has placed in the rank of nobles. Of his legitimate sons, seven are at the head of extensive provinces and kingdoms, which they govern with wisdom and prudence as might be expected of the children of one whose great qualities have not been surpassed by any person of the Tartar race. 